Good afternoon. You are in for a special treat today. Uh, this is our special Friday Forum from the City Club of Cleveland. My name is Alex Johnson, and I'm very, very proud indeed to not only welcome you, uh, but to share with you that I am president of Cuyahoga Community College and a proud City Club member. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome all of you here today uh, to the Huntington Convention Center of Cleveland uh, to introduce our forum, a panel discussion on the policy legacy of Mayor, Mayor Carl Stokes. As all of you know, we have spent the last year in our community marking the 50th anniversary of one of Cleveland's most notable achievements, the election of Carl Stokes as the first African American mayor of a major U.S. city. Throughout 2017, thanks to arts and cultural organizations, educational institutions, community-based nonprofits, funders, and many others, we have honored the legacy and remembered the many contributions of Mayor Stokes and his brother, Congressman Lewis Stokes, through a series of programs. We have had performances, exhibits, lectures, an oral history project, seminars, and the list goes on and on and on. And it has been a tremendous year in which 100 community leaders and organizations have gathered to hold 73 events in honor of the Stokes legacy. Many of you were a part of that, and I thank you. Uh, this is an aspect of our community that makes it strong, our willingness to recognize and celebrate our history. The conveners included the Jack, Joseph, and Mort Mandel Humanity Center at Cuyahoga Community College, the City Club of Cleveland, the Cleveland Foundation, the Commission on Economic Inclusion, the Greater Cleveland Partnership, the Maltz Museum of Jewish Heritage, and the Western Reserve Historical Society. Certainly none of this would have been possible without the tireless effort of Dr. Lauren Anke, Chair and Dean of the Mandel Humanities Center. Dr. Anke, unfortunately, will be leaving us for a position with National Public Radio. Uh, we will miss her, uh, but certainly wish her well. Round of applause for Dr. Lauren Anke. And I'd also like to recognize my other colleagues uh, from Cuyahoga Community College who are assembled here today and also members of our Board of Trustees who have joined us as well. As we get close to the end of this year-long initiative, Carl and Lewis Stokes honoring the past, inspiring the future, we gather today to examine the policy legacy of Mayor Stokes. Shortly after the election in 1967, and in an effort to initiate sweeping changes to improve the lives of Clevelanders, Mayor Stokes created Cleveland Now. It was his signature proposal to address the challenges of his time. As we will hear, many of the challenges that motivated him still face us today as a community. In other areas, though, we have made progress in housing, health, safety, education, economic parity. Our panelists here write about it in a policy paper being released today, and I'm pretty sure that you all received copies of it coming in. The goal of the paper and our forum today is to examine the past and inspire, inspire Clevelanders to remain steadfast in keeping the city open to innovation, collaboration, and progress for all citizens. I want to express our sincere appreciation to Augie Napoli, President of United Way of Greater Cleveland, for underwriting the report and providing vision and direction for a document that will inform the work of organizations that wish to improve the lives of all who call Cleveland home. Thank you, Augie and United Way, for your wonderful contribution to the policy document and today's event. Now, leading our discussion is Idea Stream senior host producer, Mr. Rick Jackson. 
Rick is an award-winning journalist with more than 35 years of experience as a television and radio anchor and reporter. He has been on air in all 50 states, sometimes simultaneously, and in 40 foreign countries, once again, all at the same time, <laughs> and is currently the host of Ideas and New Depth for WBIZ PBS right here in Cleveland. Mr. Jackson, I turn this forum to you to introduce our panelists. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Thank you all for being here today. As he said, I hope you all got the brochure coming in. Who I have with me are the authors and contributors of that fantastic white paper. I've, I've already had a chance to read it, so you have that to look forward to. From my immediate left, John Corlett is president and executive director of the Center for Community Solutions. Ronnie Dunn is a PhD and associate professor of urban studies at the Maxine Goodman Levin College of Urban Affairs at Cleveland State University. Amy Hanauer is the executive director of Policy Matters Ohio. Randy McShepard is the vice president of public affairs at RPM International. And Richie Paparin is director of the Center for Population Dynamics at the Maxine Goodman Levin College of Urban Affairs at Cleveland State University. A hand for our panelists. Now, to begin, rather than opening statements, it's not a debate. None of these people are running for anything, as far as I know. <laughs> I'll ask for an overview from each of the panelists. They all have various areas of expertise, their thoughts about how the Stokes era does impact us here in Cleveland today as set up for the conversation that we'll have following that. And again, have your questions ready. What we do not cover or do not touch on to your satisfaction, although I can't imagine that. There are microphones at the room, and shortly after 1 o'clock, we will have you go to those for your questions of the panelists. I will start with Ronnie Dunn and the rather disturbing thought that so much of what Mayor Stokes dealt with as he took office remains for us to deal with today. Yes, uh, Rick, first I'd like to acknowledge the extreme honor it is for me to have worked on this project with these esteemed researchers and to honor the legacy of the Stokes brothers, which I as a native Clevelander have been a direct beneficiary of. To your question, Rick, uh, the racial unrest in cities such as Ferguson, Baltimore, and Charlotte in the wake of a number of police-involved deaths of blacks has led many social and political commentators to compare the racial climate in America today to that of the 19, mid to the late 1960s, a period in which the nation witnessed more than 100 race riots. Now, the city of Cleveland experienced two race riots during that period, the 1966 Huff riots and the 1968 Glenville riots. It's within that social context that the Stokes brothers marshaled black political power to ascend to become the first African-American mayor of a major U.S. city and the first black Congress representative from the state of Ohio. In fact, the Huff riots was a catalyst for the election of Mayor Stokes in 67 in that it uh, galvanized the black vote and secondly, it garnered the, the support of the white business community for his candidacy. And I'll uh, t stop there, I could go on, mm -hmm. but uh, obviously we're short on time. Thanks, Ronnie. Amy, to have success in so many areas, people need income. And for many, the diminishing number of blue-collar jobs that followed Stokes' election is somewhat still felt by us today. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think what was so inspiring about, um, about Mayor Stokes is that he used every tool at his disposal to try to bring economic opportunity to African-American residents of Cleveland, to all residents of Cleveland, and to working people in Cleveland. So, yes, he used his formal role as mayor, to um, you know, pass laws and, and uh, allocate funding to try to ensure that low income, especially young black Clevelanders were employed. But he also used his mayoral office as a bully pulpit. He used his relationship with President Johnson, who, who very much he had his ear. And he, um, and he used the influence that he had as the mayor he wasn't afraid to take on corporations. He wasn't afraid to take on banks. He wasn't afraid to take on the police union. He used that position to exact change in the private sector and in the public sector. So it was really um, an example of kind of using every tool at your disposal mm -hmm. and, and pushing and taking that uh, position as a mayor to, to its logical conclusion and to, to do as much as you could with it. 
John, we saw a report this week putting Cleveland atop the list of premature births in America. Your own work tells us that Ohio's African-American women with four-year college degrees still have higher rates of poor birth outcomes than white women with only a high school diploma. The paper even addressed how Mayor Stokes came to office just a year after Dr. Martin Luther King said, of all forms of discrimination and inequalities, injustice in health is the most shocking and inhumane. I know you'll talk about this slow advancement these past 50 years. Sure. Thank you, Rick. I, you know, one of the things I was struck by when I started working on this uh, paper was just thinking about the context of which, in which they took office. I mean, it's only two years after the passage of Medicaid and Medicare. And Medicaid and Medicare were, at that time, probably the single most significant policy advancement related to health care for African Americans. Because prior to that, I mean, if you think about uh, Mayor Stokes and Congressman Stokes' um, own parents and themselves, I mean, his, their parent, his father died when they were very young, uh, worked in a laundromat, had no health insurance. Mother worked as a housekeeper, uh, had no health insurance. Children had no health insurance. So th they were sort of a reflection of that time before we were able t to offer that. And I, so I think you know, that's really important. And, I, and I, one of the things that I was struck by as I sort of researched this paper was how often, um, particularly Mayor Stokes in his role and later Congressman Sto Lou Stokes in his role in Congress, really pushed to have people who were most impacted by these policies in decision-making roles that he wanted them to have a seat at the table, that it was important, particularly for African Americans, if it was going to be about them, they needed to be sitting there sort of being a part of that policy conversation. I think, I think that's something we could, we could still pay attention to today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Richie, housing, the idea of self-segregation, as much as Stokes tried to open invisible boundaries and borders, they're still there now, only to a slightly lesser degree, and that still hurts people's upward mobility. Yeah, so, I mean, when I was reading it and how he looked at housing, I mean, Stokes grew up in very insecure housing, very uh, dilapidated housing. Some of the words he uses to describe that housing is really, it's, it's really stark and really shocking. And he took his experience and put it into policy. Now think about what a home is, right? It's a shelter. It's a basic right. Think about what a home has become, a commodity, real estate. So right now, when we look at the city, there's a bifurcation of the real estate market, not because home's a human right, because home's a commodity. And so when we think about home rehabilitation, we're thinking about rehabilitating the home, building the home from the roof down, not the person inside that home. So building the person and that person building the home. So just how, how everything's been um, privatized and profited from, it's created this have-have-nots environment where if you have access, you have a secure home. If you don't, you don't. How do you change that? The UN says the home is a basic right. What happened? Mm -hmm. Randall, tie it all together for us. Health, jobs, housing. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, <laughs> it would all, <laughs> <laughs> you know, for better well, educated people, all of those would be easier to attain. And yet as a city, we still like. Absolutely. I, um, in studying this, focused on the point that from 1940 to 1960, the non-white population in Cleveland grew by 132 percent. So that tells a, a lot of the story that you just heard here, because what ended up happening is shortly before Mayor Stokes took office, we had 150,000 students in the Cleveland district. And oh, by the way, the Cleveland district had the poorest uh, funding and per pupil uh, expenditure levels and so forth, which led to grave and serious overcrowding. And the overcrowding, of course, led to uh, things like dropout and uh, dissatisfaction in the community, truancy, all those kinds of things. So uh, that, of course, led to some unrest with uh, civic uh, leaders that started to accuse the schools of uh, being uh, somewhat segregated and not giving as much to the black uh, students. But of course, to Richie's uh, point, Blacks were forced to live in certain pockets of the community. Therefore, it was hard to segregate schools. And it's something that we wrestle with down the road with busing that we can talk about later. But um, education is the great equalizer. We like to talk about that. It's up to us to figure out how to help our kids in, in today's Cleveland uh, matriculate so that they can be meaningful um, contributors to the uh, overall economy and society. But um, it's something, it's probably the, the one area that uh, Mayor Stokes worked on least as compared to the other four, but clearly, um, the impact of education affects everything. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's the roots of our conversation. Now we're gonna grow the trunk of this. As I'm gonna ask questions to individuals, 
everybody's going to jump in here. I may direct a question, but we want to hear from all the panelists with their various expertise. Richie, I'll start with you. Talking of housing and a segregated city, you wrote in the report, an unraveling of federal post-war policies proved to have a devastating effect, particularly for African Americans. That included efforts to depopulate the cities by the federal government. How did the increasing suburbanization of Northeast Ohio impact Carl Stokes as he took office? And tell me about the efforts to slow that trend. So if you look at the most segregated metros in the nation, you're looking at industrial Midwest metros that were part of the Great Migration. Milwaukee, Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland. Um, now there's a history to that. Between the 20s and the 1920, 1940, there was about 200,000 African Americans that migrated to Cleveland. It's the same story in the other cities I mentioned. They did so for a job. They had less access to these jobs, um, but during World War II, there was a lot of labor. There was a lot of upward mobility during the World War, and the industrial um, jobs allowed that. What happened was, in the late 40s, there was a uh, Truman um, administration wanted to decentralize industry because they were afraid of attacks. So decentralized to the suburbs, and then decentralized to the green fields of the Sun Belt. So this was a, a volitional effort to, de you know, as a, um, a matter of uh, federal defense. Prior to the Housing Act, African Americans had to stay in their neighborhoods. They could not go to the jobs that they came for. Economic dislocation of opportunity in Cleveland and other industrial Midwest cities is still a stain today that we have to deal with. Inaccess to income is so much. Mm -hmm. Ronnie, you want to jump in? Sure. Um, along with what Richie and my co-panelists have described, uh, there was obviously forced segregation as well. Um, and my policy area was policing. And the Cleveland Now document didn't speak specifically to public safety nor policing. Uh, but Mayor Stokes did write extensively about policing in his autobiography. He devoted a chapter to it. As I mentioned earlier, the Huff riot served as a catalyst for his election. Well, the Glenville riots. 10 months into his first term in office helped dissipate a lot of that support that he had, particularly from the white and business community. Uh, the Glenville riots was the result of a shootout between black nationalists, Ahmaud Evans and the New Republic of Libya and the Cleveland police. Uh, Evans thought that his headquarters was under attack and they opened fire on the police. Well, it was discovered after the fact in that shootout, first of all, three white Cleveland police officers were killed, three black nationalists, and one black civilian were killed in the first day of, of riots and the shootout. Uh, it was later discovered that Evans had purchased some of the automatic weapons with grant funding received through the Cleveland Now project, uh, program. Mayor Stokes made the uh, controversial decision to withdraw all white police officers from the Glenville community because there were credible reports of po police retaliation and violence against black residents. Well, this infuriated the rank and file in that they had lost three brothers over there in Glenville. And this further antagonized the already uh, strained and precarious relationship of Mayor Stokes and, the and his administration and the police department. Uh, in his autobiography, Mayor Stokes stated that he took his election as mayor as a mandate to reform the Cleveland Police Department. He also added that his greatest frustration on leaving office was his inability, his futile attempts to reform the police department. And as a result of the Glenville riots, the uh, CPPA, the Cleveland Police Patrolmen's Association, was born out of that. Even to this day on their website, it states, it cites the Glenville riots as the most tragic day in Cleveland police history and the, the Glenville riots as the catalyst for its origins. So that kind of sets the context within these continual issues and divisions between particularly the African American community and the police, which we're wrestling with to this very day. 
You know, the one thing that I'd add to that, and, I, and that's a great um, recounting of the history, is that in addition to the sort of unrest of the time kind of contributing to both his rise and his fall, you also had the social movements of the time contributing to the bold agenda he was able to come in with. And so I often think at events like this, we, we talk and we praise people, the individuals who took leadership during that time. And that's great and well warranted. But the fact is, he was able to come in with an incredibly strong environmental agenda, an incredibly strong anti-poverty agenda, and an incredibly strong racial justice agenda, in large part because that was the mood of the city of Cleveland and that was the mood of the country. And so you describe that unrest and how that was challenging, but I also would just put forth that the fact that one in three Americans was in a union at that time, the fact that we had growth um, leading up to Stokes' um, term in office, our economy had nearly doubled and the wages of American workers had nearly doubled alongside that doubling of our economy. Now, since that time, our economy has just about doubled again, but it, it's, our economy has grown 6.6 .6 times faster than the typical worker's wages. And so you had this bifurcation that took place in the years since then where while the war on poverty programs that he helped inspire have made a tremendous difference, poverty would be twice as high without them, the environmental reforms that he helped inspire have made a tremendous difference. We can swim in the lake and we can fish in the river. But the economic changes that have taken place in America and the degree to which we are comfortable letting most of the proceeds in our economy go to the very top have really detracted from the policy changes that contributed in a positive way at that time. Let's stay there and talk about not just the jobs changing, but the the economics and the education that went into those jobs. Back in the day when you said everybody was in the union, you could walk out of high school, maybe not even graduate high school, and get a really good job. Now you need something beyond, and that looks at our education, looks at our jobs in a different way. Yeah, I have an interesting statistic to share with you about that. In 1960, in the city of Cleveland, 69% of whites did not finish high school, 72% of blacks did not finish high school. Think about that. That is astounding. So um, I think that it sort of uh, perpetuated a, a culture of, you know, you don't have to necessarily get the best education to live a, or enjoy a, a middle income lifestyle. Um, and it, it, I think, challenged the, the, the district in many ways, the, the, the Cleveland district. I did want to also say, uh, if I could, a little bit about busing, because we know 1976, Judge Batista said that uh, the schools were uh, you know, wrongfully uh, segregated and should do something about it. By 1979, we had our uh, busing start. I was uh, actually um, sp starting my first year of high school, the first year of busing. And what I remember is that the white students that came to John F. Kennedy High School from John Marshall, in addition to being sort of a uh, culture shock because all of a sudden they're around all these black kids, in my discussions with them the first couple of days, they were equally shocked about the fact that most of their friends weren't there. They said, I, I, people I went K through eight with, none of them, them are here. So it made me dig a little deeper to say, well, why is that, what happened? And what we started to pay attention to was the fact that Catholic schools and Jewish schools became an option for families that weren't happy with the quality of education in Cleveland. And those families were able to sort of send their kids uh, to places where they know they could get a quality education, thereby putting a lot more pressure on uh, African-American families in particular to have more dependence on the Cleveland School District and as a result, um, I think we've seen decades of uh, challenge, uh, be, be it um, you know, failed levies, and uh, we had 12 superintendents over a 20-year period, and uh, I can go on and on with all the things that have happened uh, coming up through the district myself. But it's, you know, so there's a lot of moving parts when you look at education and workforce and how they're uh, intertwined. And um, I think this document, uh, with the help of my colleagues, really uncovers a lot of it. Yeah, Richie talked about the idea of suburbanization and white flight, if it was that in the very beginning. But you're saying there was white flight in the schools without people having to move. And that left that dependence upon the black families who were behind. Yes, and interestingly enough, um, the superintendent in, 19, in, in the 70s, Paul Briggs, actually predicted that when busing happened, we would see a significant expansion or growth in white flight. And uh, no true words had been spoken. And people may not remember, at the time, the school system had 140,000 students. Now right. we're under 40. Exactly. Go ahead, Richie. So what's, what's interesting now is you have this, what, you know, what I would call white infill into the city. Right. Um, and it's kind of a suburbanization of the urban, you know, uh, urban core, um, where you're just switching out wealth from the suburbs to wealth of the city. 
So you're not really doing much to grow wealth, you're just switching it. But in cities like Philadelphia, um, where this pattern has been going on for a while, in New York City, in Brooklyn, the last, the, the neighborhoods are integrating, but the schools are still segregated. Mm -hmm. So it's still the last bastion of segregation is the school system. And it's so important. I mean, without education, right? Yeah. Without human capital, you know, what's one, left? One other point, if I may. 1969 was the year that the uh, state of Ohio peaked in manufacturing jobs, 1.5 million jobs. That was the same year that Peter Drucker said nationally that the biggest challenge facing America was the future workforce and the fact that the workforce was trending towards jobs that were more technological, scientific, mm -hmm. et cetera. So you start to see the disconnect because we didn't necessarily as an education system keep pace with where the economy was headed. Now there's other factors that Amy will tell you about, mm -hmm. but uh, that, that was something else that I thought was, was quite interesting right in the, you know, the late 60s when we were in our heyday, um, the, the, the change was happening. Yeah, no, I mean, just to build on what Randy's saying, I mean, I will also say, right, K-12 education is free. Higher education is not. And, and it's very, very expensive and growing more expensive every year. And despite that fact, Americans have gotten much more educated since the statistics that Randy cites. And we've gotten much more productive since that time. It's just that that wealth is not necessarily mm -hmm. being shared with the people helping to Agreed. produce it. And like 11, I mean, it is true what you say that we have more jobs that require higher education. But it is also true that we have a lot of jobs that are just very low paying. So 11 yeah. of the 13 most common occupations in Ohio pay less than $34,000 a year. Right. And so despite the fact that we're more educated, despite the fact that we're more productive, we're not necessarily compensating people. And I, from my perspective, that's a political choice, right? Like we're wealthier as a country than we were then. So we just have to decide whether we want to make the choice that that wealth should be shared. You know, and I would posit that that would be a nice choice to make. Okay. <laughs> Let me flip it over to health. John, talk to me about the health care of that time. We hear complaints that world-class care we have here doesn't reach into the neighborhoods. You talk about things like health disparities being an issue before we even knew that term. Mayor Stokes tried almost immediately to change that. He said, quote, health of our people was at the top of our priority list. Was that a change that led to becoming the health mecca that we are today? Well, I think um, th that uh, a couple things about health. As you point out, you know, when he was mayor and, and, when, and Congressman Stokes as well, that terms like health disparities, social determinants of health, health equity, all the phrases that are part of our language today didn't really even exist then, but they did. I mean, in, in sort of the reality of the situation. Um, uh, one of the things that the mayor, Mayor Stokes, did three days after he was inaugurated, he appointed a sort of blue ribbon commission on the crisis on welfare and, and poverty in Cleveland. At that time, there were about 42,000 children who got about 85 cents a day from the state in terms of their cash assistance. And so the mayor sort of immediately kind of went to war with the governor of the state then, Jim Rhodes, and said, you need to pass an income tax, distribute some of that wealth, so that these children get a better, uh, get a better, help, get better help from the state. And so there were things like that. And then Congressman Stokes, you know, it wasn't until the mid-80s that the term health disparities even sort of came into play. He uh, worked with the secretary then of HEW, Margaret Heckler, to appoint a commission on health care disparities for African Americans and, and pointed out that 40,000 African Americans died a year because of health disparities uh, at that time. So, and, and from his perch in Congress on the Appropriations Committee, in a, large, in a lot of ways, he was really responsible for what happened across the country to put more dollars into those efforts, more dollars into health research, sort of more work in that effort. Um, and I think, you know, and then, you know, one of the things I think they'd be very happy with today was the passage of the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, it, you know, I point out in the paper that um, when Medicare and Medicaid were created, it was 100 years before that in this country that there was ever any sort of national legislation to address the health care needs of African Americans. It would take 100 years before the passage of Medicaid and Medicare. It took almost 50 more years before we passed the Affordable Care Act. And you know, there are few groups in this country, sort of po sectors of our population, African Americans, Latinos, and others, who benefited more from that act, who were more able to get coverage. And I think coverage is sort of an essential part of this. I think the other piece, 
you know, one of the things that was challenging for them at the time and is still challenging today was the lack of resources for public health. Because you know, we know also that healthcare has actually very little to do with our health sometimes. It's more the environment that we live in, the conditions that are around us, and that, you know, and we talked we talked earlier on this panel about the role segregation played at that time. Segregation was a major factor in people's health at that point. They were confined to small neighborhoods where substandard housing, lack of sanitation, all those things, those public health strategies that make people healthier. So We've made some progress. You know, the the gap, uh, the the mortality gap between African Americans and whites is at its smallest point ever in the country's history. But there's a lot left to do. Okay. John, I wanted to ask: it, Didn't the Neon Health Clinics come out of the Cleveland now? Yeah, I mean, Northeast Ohio Neighborhood Health right. Services, or Huff Norwood, as those of us who've yes. been around a while uh, know them as. They were one of the products. They were one of the first. They're still one of the largest federally qualified health centers in the country. Certainly, right. the largest in Ohio. Okay. Great Thank events. you. I'm Rick Jackson, senior host and producer for IdeaStream. Today we are enjoying a Friday Forum at the Huntington Convention Center of Cleveland on the 50-year policy legacy of Mayor Carl B. Stokes, featuring John R. Carlett, President, Executive Director for the Center for Community Solutions, Dr. Ronnie Dunn, Associate Professor of Urban Studies at the Maxine Goodman Levin College of Urban Affairs at Cleveland State University, Amy Hanauer, Executive Director of Policy Matters Ohio, Randall McShepard, Chairman and Co-Founder of Policy Bridge, and Richie Paparin, and the Director of the Center for Population Dynamics at the Maxine Goodman Levin College of Urban Affairs at Cleveland State University. We are about to begin the audience Q&A. If you have a question, please form a line behind either of the microphones that we have here. Our staff members are standing there. We welcome questions from everybody, City Club members or not, guests, students, those of you joining us via our radio broadcast or the webcast. If you would like to tweet a question, please tweet it at the City Club, and our staff will try and work that into the program. Could I have the first question, please? I'll get things going here. Uh, Richard, you started out talking about how Carl Stokes talked about housing, talked about his own home, and you, you kind of moved very quickly into human capital, ideas about human capital. But I wanted to ask you uh, and others on the panel to go back and talk more about housing policy and what you think recommendations you you have in those areas sure sure so you know I started the piece and you know Albert or uh, Maslow the theory of human motivation so it's the er hierarchy of needs so if up top you have self-actualization you're, you're you're whole but at the bottom is you need food <laughs> right you need to be physically safe you need shelter and Stokes really understood that to get the person you need shelter so what he did was he built 5,600 public units during his tenure. And for, I think, 10 years prior, there was no public housing units built mm -hmm. for his two, the two previous administrations. They did, they did a housing policy. It was called planned abandonment. And it was in areas not too far from here. So what they did was they did nothing. And they let housing and neighborhoods deteriorate. So people were forced to leave. And then when they were forced to leave, they demolished buildings. And when they demolished buildings, they sold it to developers. Right? That is the perfect example of going from a right to a commodity. So the simple act of building. So when he moved to Outhwaite, he was surprised that he had painted walls and, and separate bedrooms. And these basic things that we all take for granted. He was a wide-eyed kid. So the basic right of building public units. That is a major shift from his predecessors. Mm -hmm. Now, it didn't last very long, right? The 1970s, Cleveland lost one out of every four people. And Daniel Kerr's book, um, The Forgotten Fires, there was more arsons in Cleveland than almost anywhere in the nation. Purposeful arsons by white owners mm -hmm. that could cash out by the insurance companies. So the actual destruction of housing for profit, that was also... Um, uh, a, a policy, but building housing for people. And if I could just jump on that really Please. quickly, I mean, in, in terms of the theme today of inspiring the future, you know, how can it be that it has been 50 years that we've gotten richer every year as a country and we still have lead in homes in Cleveland? I mean, talk about tying together what Randy's talking about, what Richie's mm -hmm. talking about, and what John's talking about. You know, we have, a, we have 
chemicals in our homes that make that ensure that kids are going to do less well in school, right? right? And right. we are and we don't use our wealth to to clean that up. So I just think it really ties together the, all of the themes on this panel, it also makes people more violent and more likely to get involved in the criminal justice system. So it's just, it's unthinkable that we have not applied the wealth of this country to solve that kind of problem. And for a backdrop and a lot of information on that, both cleveland.com and ideastream.org, you can find plethora of stories that yeah. we and the Plain Dealer have done regarding the lead situation, which is one of the things that really as a city we need to address in a forthwith way. Thank you. Next question. This question is for Mr. McShepard and yeah. anyone else on the panel who's able to answer. Um, I know you were very instrumental in creating Riddall Urban Farm, yeah. and I wanted to ask how food deserts back during Mayor Stokes's uh, tenure as mayor and how, how they compare to now in the city of Cleveland and how the mayor addressed them then and if that is a situation that has gotten better in Cleveland or worse or stayed the same? You know, that's a good question. I, I personally didn't in, in research, you know, food deserts. Perhaps uh, some of my colleagues might have information. But what I would surmise is that because African Americans were sort of forced to live in one particular or several particular neighborhoods, you know, in the 60s in particular, we did have uh, black grocers and, and stores and places where people could shop because we had to create those things because otherwise we wouldn't get it. Um, as uh, out-migration happened and uh, abandonment happened and foreclosures and other kinds of things happened, to demolition, you started to see the disinvestment, you know, grow. And uh, as a result, fast forward to today, you now have communities where um, you, you have so much vacant land uh, that uh, things like the, the Riddall Farm make sense because you're bringing life back and jobs back to an area that wouldn't otherwise have any sort of investment. So um, when I think about housing, I just wanted to also say that the biggest lesson from Carl Stokes, in my estimation, is courage, because it took courage for him to build those public housing units that Richie talked about, and we need courage right now in Cleveland when you think about some of the neighborhoods that are being ignored, disinvested. I mean, let's talk about the southeast side of Cleveland. There, I know there's some community development people in the room. Um, we need to have the same courage that Stokes had to say, enough's enough. Our entire city needs to benefit. Let's invest where we know the investment is needed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, hi, thanks. Uh, I want to ask if you can elaborate a little bit. Uh, John Corlett got in, into it a bit, but maybe some of the other panelists have to offer. Uh, there's a tendency to have this sort of discussion about clean air and clean water is kind of up here and talk about it as a, an amorphous activity. But what it really is is kind of the, uh, the roll up of all of thousands of littler steps. And I wonder if you can comment about Stokes and his administration taking some of those littler steps. So for instance, when I was reading up on some things, I was fascinated that one of the first things that he was really aggressive on was taking on rats in neighborhoods and uh, demoralized housing. If ever you could do something to try and improve the health outcomes for kids, that might be it. But there must be other sort of smaller steps that he, he was leading on, and I wonder if you can talk about that, not just kind of a visionary Stokes, but also a roll up your sleeves and take on littler projects, mayor, administration. Well, I, I mean, I, I can think of a couple things, uh, and, and, and they sort of fit into that little uh, context. Uh, one was um, opening uh, new health centers, uh, health centers that offered services that our health centers don't offer today that were very comprehensive. You know, the McCafferty Health Center in Ohio City opened uh, during his first term. And another really simple little thing that he made, he instituted, and it was actually a big part of Cleveland now, was funding to establish bus lines from the east side to Metro Health. Uh, because before that time, there were simply bus lines for people to reach that hospital. And so he put funding in place to do that because he knew it was important for people to be able to access their public hospital. So I think you, you see, as, you're, as you say, some of the visionary things, but there was also just the, the stuff that a mayor does, you know, fixing problems uh, that affect his uh, constituents. Yeah, and I think on environmental issues, there was also a willingness to embrace creativity, not, 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 not that it always worked, right? So like, I think about today, and I think that Mayor Stokes would be all for those wind turbines out in the lake, right? Because he saw that our polluted river was, it, it, that our environmental problems and our human problems were one and the same, right? Like our people were living in these cities, and I think, and they were living in rat-infested homes, and they were 
unable to swim in the lake. And so they had this kind of crazy thing where they put up these plastic barriers in the lake so that people could swim and they would sort of clear out an area. It, it didn't seem like maybe the most um, technologically brilliant solution, but it was a willingness to take on an environmental problem of the time and apply our ingenuity to try to solve it. And I think that we could use more of that today because while at that time, I think it was residents of places like Cleveland who maybe suffered the most from pollution, today with climate change, we see that poor and of color populations all over the globe suffer the most from our potential climate change. And so I think that Stokes today would be very embracing of solutions to reduce contributions to global warming. And again, it's, you know, it's trying things, right? Mm -hmm. else? Okay, next question, thank you. Thank you, and this leads right into um, the previous comments. If Carl Stokes were mayor today, what do you think might be some of his signature issues? Well, if I might. Yes, I, please. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. I think that he would still be um, dealing with the issues around the police, obviously. As the city is currently under a uh, federal consent decree, so those issues that uh, Mayor Stokes sought to address in 1967 through 71 are today finally uh, be beginning to be addressed. Now, we, we won't know what the outcome of that actually is for some time. The thing is, those problems don't stop at the city borders. Mm -hmm. So we see in, in suburban jurisdictions now, and as I think Richie might have touched on, I know he did in the paper, the uh, suburbanization of blacks now. So right. these, man these problems that were primarily manifest in the city during the 60s and 70s are now being uh, experienced out in the suburbs. And uh, the thing is, and, and one of the recommendations I make, and I think uh, Mayor Stokes and Congressman Stokes, who actually had a more profound impact on policing, would be proponents for are those jurisdictions outside of those that come under federal oversight, adopting some of those policies and procedures uh, that those particular agencies, in, uh, such as Cleveland, are compelled to, to adopt. And it only makes good sense. Those are best practices. Uh, the latest, most innovative policies and procedures, that's what goes into a consent decree. So why wouldn't a Euclid, a Bedford Heights, or uh, those other municipalities look at the, that document and adopt those policies and practices to the extent possible? I, I think the, um, in this idea of black flight, so since 2005, and it's in the analysis we did, so the black flight is eight times white flight in the city since 2005. So the white flight is almost um, zero out, and eight times now. So the suburbanization of African Americans not, and um, Latinos, it's not just a Cleveland thing, it's a national thing. They're suburbanizing at rates that whites did in the 40s, 50s, but the issue is you know, there's a lot of investment now coming back into the city, particularly around the health tech corridor. So the Eds and Meds is a really huge job engine and a huge investment engine um, for the city. And it's one of the biggest in the state. And so how, you know, I think about Stokes, what is the, how do you protect the tenured residents through, um, I mean, Mayor Jackson right now is doing um, forgivable loans for instance, um, on rehabs in places of Huff in Fairfax where a lot of this investment's coming in. Because gentrification on the east side is likely to happen, believe it or not. Um, just really briefly, I mean, so, you know, it's hard to be a mayor in a beleaguered city, right? But one of the things that Stokes really did was to push for federal policy. So you know what? The minimum wage was higher when, when Carl Stokes was mayor than it is today, the federal minimum wage. I think he'd support a higher minimum wage at the federal level in the United States. And the other thing is... He supported federal investment in an urban agenda and in our cities. He sure wouldn't be for the budget coming out of the House Ways and Means Committee of the, um, 
Republican no. Congress that came out yesterday, right, that, that disinvests mm -hmm. in favor of tax cuts to the wealthiest Americans and corporations, the very people who have benefited most from the changes in our economy, he would, he would favor increasing their taxes to reinvest in our communities, not the reverse, which is what's happening. Another program I think of right now is First Year Cleveland. Where do you think he would stand on that? Define your terms. First year, <laughs> oh, the education <laughs> process. Say oh, oh. For, say say yes to education. Say first year. Well, okay, that one too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he would. So I would think he would well, support I, that. I, I mean, I think the you know uh, I think um, uh, Randy touched on this earlier. I mean, he he didn't really have a presence in edu in the education issues as much when he was married because he didn't have the control. I mean, you know, he he was in a different spot. So, but I think, right. you know, I mean, I think everything about him would would be that he would be sort of in favor of things that improve the well-being and life of young children in the city. I mean, I can't imagine. So let's go over here. Hi, I'm Zona Zavala, and I represent East End Neighborhood House, one of our neighborhood centers on the south east, uh, east side of Cleveland. I wanted to ask how might we share the information that we're sharing today uh, and all the wonderful studies and research that you're doing. I know there's some efforts around a curriculum for schools, but how do we share this information at the neighborhood level um, so that people, because I do believe in the power of history, uh, to be able to fuel some of that social movement that then lead us to these great places of policies. Um, but I don't know that that proximity, we've met that yet. You know, these events are wonderful and it doesn't, you know, I don't miss the reality of being honored to be here and receive this information, but how do we get this information into our neighborhoods? Um, and uh, to the point that I'm even offering East End to help somehow uh, with that because it's in the neighborhoods that we need to raise again that sense of hope um, and true engagement. And I think that that could happen through history. So. Um, how may we do that? And if we don't have a well, how, I, I, I'm willing to talk about that. Yeah, one, one, one easy solution in my estimation would be to start to incorporate this into uh, our curriculums in our schools. I mean, our kids need to hear about the history and all the great things that have happened and uh, to know uh, the accomplishments of uh, Carl and Lou Stokes because um, I don't re recall uh, seeing much of that in, in the last 20 years. I've worked very closely with the Cleveland schools um, and my wife's an educator. She'll tell you that you, know, you, ne you rarely see those kinds of things uh, at the, to the level that they should uh, be seen in school. So that kids get not only uh, learn about their communities, but start to have a sense of pride of what's possible. And uh, I can come from Outhwaite Public Housing and you know, become a, a, you know, a congressman or mayor someday. It's just not there. Um, I don't think it would be difficult for schools to even incorporate that. It's just a matter of having the will to do it and having broader community uh, support for it, which I'm sure we could get. And while we're getting there, I'll just say, I mean, there's two, pa two tables out there with a bunch of my staff. We are happy to come to East End. Uh, there are more charismatic younger people on my <laughs> staff than I, and we, we would love to be at East End and talking about uh, some of the things we learned from this project. I think the schools are powerful, um, and, and that's a way to get to the young people, but I'm speaking also to the residents and people in the trenches right now being affected by everything that's happening, yep. and how do we get the information to them? Well, and I think neighborhood enough. centers are a powerful you know, point place mm -hmm. where you could begin to do some of that work. Yes, you are the city halls of a lot of our neighborhoods. I mean, so um, I agree. Um, if, if any of us could come out, I'm sure, sure. we'd be happy yeah. to do it. And to that point, uh, someone mentioned the Riddall Farm that I'm involved with. We do a lot of environmental education at the farm on 82nd and Kinsman. People come and learn about the history of the neighborhood and why it's up to them to be environmental stewards and to take back their neighborhoods, have pride in their neighborhoods. So it, you know, it's possible. Um, we just need organizations, you're right, not just to sit on a stage for one day like today, but to incorporate it into our daily work. Thank you. Sure, good afternoon. Cleveland continues to be amongst the uh, most segregated of cities in the country, uh, self uh, um, by choice and also by lake. The lake is one of the defining metrics of that segregation in terms of residential, where we live. What strategies, what ideas do you have so that we could begin to change that and become a much more thriving and diverse uh, community as a city? Well, uh, I would suggest, first of all, and, and Randy mentioned courage earlier, it's going to take political and uh, civic will on the parts of uh, our 
public officials as well as our community leaders. And, you know, my area of focus is primarily criminal justice. That's my area of expertise. And much of what drives the uh, criminal justice system in our country are, is based on stereotypes, racial stereotypes. Mm -hmm. So when we can uh, incorporate equity and equality and making sure that our criminal justice system operates in a just and fair manner regardless of background, then I think we can begin to break down some of those myths and those stereotypes that are perpetuated that in turn continue to drive the self-segregation. I mean, when you turn on the news and you hear about all of the violence and you, you see the statistics with the disproportionate number of African Americans and minorities in the criminal justice system, well, on a even maybe not a conscious but a subconscious level, that reinforces some of those racial stereotypes which right. then justify self-segregation. So there was a, an interesting study that came out and they looked at the metropolitan regions of the nation um, since 1990, and they showed that whites are living in more integrated neighborhoods than ever before, or integrated um, metros and cities than ever before. But they also showed that there was a catch. Within the city, they're living, it's, it's, it's mostly white um, blocks and streets. So you can have an integrated metro, but there's still self-segregation at the street and block level. That's the problem. Why don't we want to live next to yeah. each other? Right. You, know, you know, it's a huge issue. Uh, you know, if I could add, uh, you know, we, our, our civic leaders promote the uh, diversity in, of, of Cleveland. We're ethnically diverse community, but racially segregated within that diversity, to Richie's point. I'll just say I also do think that policy has contributed to this, right? Like we have in Ohio had primarily sprawl without growth, right? Like our population, we're losing members of Congress. But we have promoted ex-urban development in ways that drain resources out of the city. So that doesn't answer the problem of segregation block by block. But I think that it does answer that if we could recreate some of that vibrancy, it would pull people back in. And, and I think that's part We're of it. We're creating answer. places for flight to become. Yes. Yes. Another question. Hi, so anyone on the uh, panel can answer this. My question is more around the challenges that seniors have. We talk about from a health perspective and from housing. Uh, you know, a lot of the government programs that were initiated to help build affordable housing for seniors have ended. And so when we think about the lowest income seniors in our country, 74% of them, or I'm sorry, of people over the age of 65 are spending 74% of their income on rent, meaning that they're, you know, burdened by their rent. They're not able to pay for medication. They're not able to do the things that keep them healthy. How does that, I guess, feed off of some of the inequality from an income perspective or housing and health care that we still see today? Richard, you want to start this off? John, okay, well, jump actually, in. I, th okay. I think of two things. Um, uh, first thing is we need to strengthen Social Security rather than weaken it because in many of our neighborhoods, older adults, Social Security is their only source of income. And so, you know, efforts to sort of weaken that program or cut that program uh, would have a disproportionate share. Also, uh, any efforts to raise the retirement age would have a disproportionate you know, impact on uh, African American people of color because they tend to have shorter lifespans. And so uh, you wouldn't want to do that. Then the other thing that we've been sort of focused on lately is, um, is trying to figure out how we get more um, older adults to have access to the um, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, the SNAP program. Because one of the things that has been sort of proven now is if we can raise people's benefits, older adults' benefits for those programs, uh, uh, no surpri not surprisingly, they have lower hospital admissions, they have lower nursing home admissions, and we can actually save money, actually, uh, in healthcare costs. I think part of the problem now is trying to figure out, you know, we've got, healthcare is a big part of our economy. We have a lot of money invested in it, and part of what we've got to figure out is how to maybe liberate some of those dollars and get them out into the community in sort of public health, community health strategies that might actually improve everybody's well-being and their health and save money. Mm -hmm. And what the seniors aren't spending on health care, they're spending on housing. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. One more question. All right. Well, thank you very much. First of all, I commend everyone here for the policy that was presented and that I received yesterday from Dr. Anki. 
Um, Dr. Dunn, you and I have testified on some police issues together before city council. Randy, obviously, we've worked together in the community for some time. I'm going to point this the series of questions that I'm going to frame up for the two of you to begin, being black in particular. Number one, how would Carl, St take this perspective. We have black leaders around this country that derived after the election in 1967 that allowed for the Maynards, the Gibsons, and Newark, on and on, to become leaders of their particular city. And then today, the environment issue that my father took on, obviously, we keep talking about Carl Stokes, but it's a collective because he brought in other experts to be able to work with him. But from the environmental standpoint, as a black man, and again, we're looking at the time frame, 1967, 69, very early, unrest in the community. So how do you feel that black leaders are addressing environmental issues amidst all of the broader universal issues in comparison to Carl Stokes? Thank you, let's go ahead and answer that one first. <laughs> well, quickly, I'm on a clock. Well, this, is, this is regarding my father. Okay. All right, so and you're gonna be up there talking about black and white issues and policies and books, but you don't have the ability to do like Helen Forbes and I can right. where we're sitting in the home to mm -hmm. talk about these issues outside of what you read in the newspapers. So I'm listening to something and I know what I've heard in the home. So when you deal with the Harlell Jones, how are black leaders engaging community leaders in their community like a Harlell Jones to be able to deal with issues relevant to their particular communities? Are they being successful? You also have the removal of the police that took place. That wasn't done by an autonomous decision. That was done within the community broader text mm -hmm. to come to that conclusion. How is that, which is a major undertaking, how can that be relevant today with all the police issues? Then the schools, you're incorrect. The schools was a very pertinent part of my father's intent and desire. It would just happen to be more so when he was a judge mm -hmm. that he was against charter schools and the illegal funding of the schools that we found out back in those days because he needed that money to be kept in the community and for the Cleveland public schools to be the best of what it can be despite the challenges. And then lastly, what he did was autonomous in some nature when he became mayor. He ensured that those banking industries and other entities, the contractors in this community, of course, the union issue, which I work with unions very well today, represent them, contractors. They're much better than what they were today. How do you see black leaders today forcing banking institutions and other entities who come to City Hall to continue to do business yet do not allow for the diversity to be a part of that whole process. So give me an overview of what you will say without books of how black people, black leaders in particular, can be able to address just a few of these issues that I wanted to ask of. I will say quickly because I, I suspect that time is not our friend that I would be willing to work with you to put together a conference to talk about this very issue. This needs time, this needs the right people at the table, thoughtful interventions, a study of best practices, all those kinds of things. What, what has worked in other uh, cities, urban areas? What might we try to do here? Um, I would say that African American leaders have to step up. I mean, uh, it's, we've talked enough it's a matter of stepping up and owning uh, some of these issues, uh, be it how, how we work with uh, you know, minority entrepreneurs, how we work with uh, ex-offenders, how we improve our schools, how we uh, you know, deal with the, the safety issues that Ronnie uh, so eloquently talked about. It's just time for us to step up and uh, actually execute because certainly in my day, uh, what drives me is that um, I'm all about taking action. And I think um, Ronnie would agree that um, 
that's the, the key part of it, not just talking about it, not just writing a research report about it, but testing out things. Uh, Ronnie, I'll yield the rest of my time. Yes, yes, <laughs> thank you. Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, Cordell, I say that, and some of my students and others that are, my colleagues have probably heard me say on numerous occasions, that during the 60s, Cleveland had the most progressive black community in the country. In order to elect your father as mayor in 67, at a time when the black community was only 37% of the population. But I add, since that time period, we've probably been one of, if not the most, regressive black communities. When you look at the condition in the African American community. And a lot of that, unfortunately, has taken place, or not unfortunately, but it just has, it's a fact, has occurred under black leadership at the highest level of local government. We've had, we've, we're the largest, we're, we're the, we had the first African American mayor. We've had the longest experience of having black leadership among big cities at the municipal level. We've had three African American mayors, 28 years under black leadership. But then when you look at the conditions in our community, we have very little to show for it. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Always when we get rolling, it's time to stop. I'm going to have to turn the time over to Dr. Alex Johnson. So this is, uh, thank all of you. Nice round of applause for the panel. Thank you. Certainly we are delighted that uh, Carl and Teresa could, I'm sorry, Cordell and, and Teresa could join us today. And uh, Cordell, what you've done is really uh, provide more excitement uh, to an important part of this project. It was our sincere hope that the policy document would serve us steadfastly in years to come, uh, and we need an opportunity to explore it and to determine those things that are necessary to ensure that we reclaim our rightful place, uh, not only in our state, but also in our country, and that's what uh, this is all about. So thank you, uh, and Teresa. And the other thing I will share with you is that uh, uh, the policy document uh, will serve as a kind of foundation, for lack of a better term, uh, for the academic conference that's being held this weekend, beginning tonight at the, at the um, Jerry Sue Thornton Center. So I would invite all of you to be there and be part of that conversation. And throughout, uh, during the upcoming months, uh, we will be hosting the, the uh, Stokes Civic Leadership Institute designed to train individuals to be steadfast and, uh, uh, and involved in the development of our community uh, by learning more about it and by working with organizations and mentors. So just a brief reminder that there's a lot more work to do. So today at the City Club, we have been enjoying a Friday forum, a Friday forum at the Huntington uh, Convention Center of Cleveland on the 50th year policy legacy of Mayor Carl B. Stokes. Uh, please be reminded that the presenting sponsors for today's forum are Cuyahoga Community College and the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District. Our supporting sponsors is, uh, it, uh, is RPM International Incorporated. Uh, we appreciate your support of City Club programming. Today's forum is the George Dively Forum on Cleveland's Tomorrow, uh, made possible by generous gifts from the George Dively Foundation we are grateful for their support as well. Today's discussion is the final forum in the Stokes Honoring the Past, Inspiring the Future series. The City Club of Cleveland is proud to be a partner in the year-long community-wide commemoration of the 50th anniversary of Carl Stokes' election as Mayor of Cleveland. Mayor Stokes and his brother, Congressman Lewis Stokes, played key roles in the advancement of the city and the nation through the civil rights movement and beyond. We welcome guests at tables hosted by the Center for Community Solutions, the Cleveland Leadership Center, Cleveland State University, Policy Matters, Ohio, and the United Way of Greater Cleveland. And that brings us to the end of today's forum. Thank you, John, uh, Randy, Amy, um, Ronnie, sound like the Jackson Five. <laughs> <laughs>
and Richie. <laughs> and thank you, Rick, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. The forum is now adjourned. <laughs>